Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Escalera, the True Love Rebel, and I'm here today with Connie Costa, and she is a transformational coach, international speaker, published writer, and entrepreneur. She graduated from Antioch a university with a master's degree in clinical psychology with an applied community psychology specialization. Connie was personally mentored and coached by legendary life coach, inspirational speaker, and best-selling author Alan Cohen. Her clients are mostly women, LGBT, and celebrities. Connie's book, I Give Myself Butterflies, Tips on Every Extraordinary Living and Self-Love, will be coming out early in 2017. She produces inspirational networking foodie events and leads workshops and retreats in Beverly Hills, Ojai, and Italy. Join Connie on her next exclusive and unique food tour in Sicily, Italy. And please visit her webpage. Um, It is www.conniecosta.com. Well, welcome, Connie. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes. And so the reason why I invited you is I love your your story, um, and I wanted the women to have an opportunity to hear about your love story and your relationship, and uh, I'd like to get into it. And uh, tell us a little bit about... Um, how long you've been married to your husband, and including before, and how did you know he was the one? Well, first of all, I apologize if I sound sexy. I'm getting over a cold. But, um, <laughs> um, but yes, again, thank you. I'm honored to be on the call. And, um, yeah, we've been together for a very long time, my husband and I. We've been together over 17 years um, and have been friends for almost 20, actually. So we were actually friends wow. before we um, before we started dating, and um, how did I know he was the one? Well, um, there were several things that I saw in George that I didn't see in other people. First of all, um, the love that he had for his family, and that was huge for me. I grew up in Sicily, Italy, and um, family is everything in in Italy. And I grew up watching my cousins um, and, and seeing um, – they were, they were a great example for me. They really set the bar high. In Sicily, at least, you know, back in my days, not that I'm old, but uh, back in my days, <laughs> you would um, <laughs> search for the one at a, quite a, an early age. When you were a teenager, you would start looking for the one. And um, you would uh, find the love of your life. You would get married. The, the weddings were beautiful. Um, they, they would move into these gorgeous homes and, you know, have kids. And they all looked really, really happy. I mean, genuinely happy. And, um, of course, they didn't have perfect lives, perfect marriages, but it looked, it just looked like a really stable relationship. And that's what I wanted in my life because I had seen that um, ever since I was very young. That's what I wanted. And um, so I knew that I wanted a family guy, somebody that was interested in um, you know, starting a family, and he was always talking about his nieces, his little nieces, that were mm-hmm. I think, like three and like five at the time, and um, he would show me pictures. It was just like the sweetest thing. Here's this young guy um, talking about his nieces, and so I'm like, this guy has a really big heart. <clears throat> the other thing I do, this is actually funny, I would test him. He was in, <laughs> he was actually, this going to sound horrible, but hey, I was testing it. He was, yeah, in a no. horrible, he was in a horrible relationship before. I mean, very, this, this woman was not um, the nicest person in the world to him uh, in general. And um, so I I knew that they were um, on the rocks and that any day, he, he, would, he would say it, that, you know, they, he didn't think that they were going to last. And um, so I was like, would you ever cheat? I'm your girlfriend, and um, I'll never forget his face. He looked down, and he was very, very serious, and he's like, no, I would never do that to her. And I'm mm. like, yes, he's a good mm-hmm. guy. <laughs> right, right, exactly, yes, the magic question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so, um, and so, yeah, and so I knew he was a good guy, and I and I knew that 
that uh, his relationship was was ending and it was going to end soon and it did and then as soon as it did uh, no neither of us cheated <laughs> mm-hmm. as soon as it did uh, we started going out as friends and then eventually mm-hmm. we started dating and then um, and then it's been ever since we've been together awesome and then during those early dating uh, times how did you feel when you were with him oh my gosh I was uh, elated I was so <laughs> <laughs> I was, I mean, literally, I remember being just so, so, so super excited because I was, um, I had never been in love like that before. And so it was just, um, I was, I had a crush on him for so long. So it was like, mm-hmm. oh my God, a dream come true uh, for me. And um, so just, I mean, utter happiness. And um, it's, you know, Dr. Martini calls it the infatuation stage. And there was definitely infatuation at that time mm-hmm. <laughs> where everybody, and it's funny because now when I look back, um, when people start dating, there there's this infatuation stage and um, it could be quite dangerous because during that stage, you build up a fantasy of how the relationship should be. And um, right. you only remember the good because there's all these lovely chemicals going on in your body that are <laughs> being released. Um, mm-hmm. You get addicted to that feeling and you create these fantasies and you ignore all the signs of things that you don't like. You ignore them. You, you're just looking at the good, only the good. Mm-hmm. So, for example, say, you know, you're, you're dating somebody and he doesn't talk much, you know, you're the one that talks most of the time. At the time, you're infatuated, so you're like, it's so beautiful, he listens to me so much, it's so wonderful. He's, uh, he's so sweet, he just lets me talk, I could talk for hours. And then, you know, years later, when the infatuation is definitely over, um, it's, well, why don't you ever talk? Why don't you say anything? I, I don't like that. Why, why, why is it that I don't have a conversation with you? It's just a one-way conversation. I'm the only one that's talking. Mm-hmm. And that's what we do. We do that mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. During the infatuation yeah. stage, we ignore all those red flags or all the signs, and we definitely just create this uh, unrealistic fantasy that they have to live up to. And then once they don't, once they're human, because we're all human, and once we see that, we crucify them and get angry at them for not being who we created in our mind them to be. They're not, that's not them. We created that fantasy, but we get mad mm-hmm. at them. How dare you not live up to my fantasy? <laughs> right, right, right. So, so when I think of our relationship in the beginning, yeah, I, I certainly have this like sense of, oh, that was so sweet. It was so beautiful. It was so magical. And at the same time, I totally see where I created this fantasy of George, you know, being this perfect, perfect partner in every sense of the word. And when mm-hmm. I look back, truly, I remember that. Oh yeah, he was he was who he's always been. And yeah. I I but I ignored all that, and then later in the relationship, I'm like, well, you're not like this, and you're not like that, and how dare you not be like this? And so it's interesting, and I want I, I tell my clients this all the time so that they could see it and and put people in a more balanced perspective as opposed to too high or too low. Right, right. So the key is that you really, yeah, absolutely. The key is, and I can uh, relate to that experience because I've been in with my boyfriend for seven years and it's the same thing. He's the same person who I met seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think Mm -hmm. that's really a key thing to bring up. And what were the types of guys that you uh, attracted before your husband? Well, I dated here and there, but um, I only had one um, serious relationship before my husband, and he was he was amazing. He was extraordinary. He treated me like a queen. He was the kind of guy that would write me love poems and, um, you know, always constantly um, saying beautiful things to me. And, and but uh, he discovered a little thing called Coke, not Coca Cola, mm. cocaine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, and it was downhill from there. And um, I tried to save him. I was young at the time. I was very, very young. And at the time, I tried to save him. I thought I could save him. I thought I could fix him. This is way before I got a degree in psychology. <laughs> so I had no idea. Right. right. Um, I tried to fix him. I tried to save him. Gave him money, thinking it was going to go to rent. Mm. Definitely didn't go to rent. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, it started getting bad. It started getting bad in the sense where, he, you know, cocaine makes you extremely paranoid. 
And, um, you know, there would be a guy a thousand feet away, and he would say, oh, my God, he's looking at you. You're looking at him. You guys are going to have an affair. I mean, this just makes you really paranoid. So it started getting getting scary in that sense where it was like, no, this guy, you know, he, it looks like he's going to lose it any second. And um, so I knew. I was like, no, I can't. I can't deal with this. I'm not going to allow myself to go through this. And, um, and I know that and, and, and inside of me, I, I kept trying to fix him. I, I had this vision of fixing him. And when I was seeing that, you know, time after time after time, nothing was happening. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. So I literally bought him a one-way ticket back to his uh, family. I'm like, I'm going to mm-hmm. buy you a train ticket and you're going to go be with your family. And they're going to have to, um, have to deal with this because I can't, I can't do this. I, mm-hmm. um, I, I refuse to go through this. Mm-hmm. What and was that, that turning was point that. for you? Was there something specific that was that turning point in, inside of you to, to have the courage to buy that ticket? I think it was a combination of what I said, the, 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 part, the part where he was getting really crazy jealous. Mm-hmm. And uh, one day he was, telling me that the television was talking to him. So once mm-hmm. I saw, you know, I didn't know anything about drugs at all, at all. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, once I got my psych degree, everything made sense. At the time, it didn't. I was young, and it, none of this made sense to me. Um, but it sounded it was scary. It was very scary when somebody's telling you that the television's angry and it's, you know, getting mad. It's just it was stuff that, to me, was very frightening, and I couldn't understand it. And so I'm like, this is not getting any better. I'm giving him money supposedly to save him from, you know, getting evicted or giving him food. And he's not even using it for that. Um, and so I thought, no, I don't want to, I can't do this. I'm, I'm worth a lot more than this. And, um, mm. and so it was, it was a combination of that really that made me go, no. <clears throat> and I gotta be honest, I, I really did think, I guess a part of me thought he would go get better and then come back. <laughs> yeah. Right, and then right. we would be happily ever after because we were engaged. We were going to get married, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, so a part of me thought, you know, my his family is going to fix him. Since I can't fix him, his family is going to go fix him. And then he'll come back and we'll be together. But oh, wow. obviously that didn't happen. Yeah. Right. And it's interesting because at the time, I remember I remember very well crying hysterically in my room. There were like romantic songs would come on and I would be bawling in my room, just suffering, like, you know, that he was far away and God knows what was going on, if he was still on drugs or not. And I remember thinking at the time, this was like the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. And now, of course, looking back, you know, that was the best thing that happened to me. And so I always tell people when things look horrific at the time when you're going through really really challenging times there's a gift there is a gift out of all of our challenges every single one and this i know a hundred percent to be true Mm -hmm. there will be a gift there is a blessing if we all if we look at everything from a neutral standpoint again i'm going to quote him a lot because uh, I've been um, studying for years Dr. Martini, and I, I find him to be a fascinating, fascinating man. And um, his, his, uh, his work is amazing. I, I encourage everybody to, to look into Dr. Martini. But Dr. Martini, you know, stresses on the fact of looking at everything from a neutral standpoint. It's not the most extraordinary thing, and it's not the worst thing. It's neutral. We give meaning to everything. Every single thing we give meaning to it. So at the time, I was giving the meaning that this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Now I could see where I had seen that from a more balanced perspective and seen, well, what gifts could possibly be coming from this? Well, the greatest gift of my life came from that, which was George. Mm-hmm. Um, once, you know, months after my partner had left is when George and I started getting closer and closer and co- closer because of this incident. And then eventually started dating. Once he had broken up with his partner and I had broken up with my partner, we started going out, like I said before. And um, and it's been, he's literally been the greatest gift in my life. And so um, I always tell people to to look at the blessing or wait for the blessing. 
and um, mm-hmm. and I guarantee that it's there. If you look at it, it's there. You might not see it right away. I mean, it took me a long time to see that, but mm-hmm. it's there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And after that relationship, did it have any effect on your self-esteem or your self-love? And how did you get through that? Um, you know, I've always this is this is this is what happened to me that made my self-esteem go up because it was very down when I was a kid. I was severely bullied as a kid, very badly, and my self-esteem was in the gutter for sure. I mean, even the teachers were abusive towards me, very mean. I remember teachers being very, very mean to me. I remember coming, because I, I, I grew up in Italy, and then I came from Italy, and I, I could barely speak English. I can barely speak English now, but imagine back then. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my English was really, really bad, and um, I would be teased every single day. And um, it was you know, if it was one thing, it was another, you know, it was just I was totally European in every way and um, <laughs> constantly made fun of because of who I was. That's the interesting thing, you know. When you're mm-hmm. bullied, you're being bullied for who you are, which really hurts, right, because then you think, well, something's wrong with me. I must I must be a bad person. I must be a bad human being because they're saying that what I'm doing is stupid or what I'm doing is not good. And so... Um, my self-esteem was pretty, pretty low. And then one day I decided when I was, when I had to um, choose a high school, I said, you know what? High school is going to be different. This is it. This is not, I'm not going to allow um, this to continue. I'm not going to be bullied in high school. I'm not going to allow it to happen. It was literally like a moment of a clear decision that I made. This is not going to happen. I'm, I refuse to let this happen for another four years. Because that would have been hell. And, right. I mean, I literally remember distinctly saying to myself, no. Mm-hmm. And I chose Notre Dame Academy in West Los Angeles. And um, once you make that decision, it's like when you make this decision of, like, no, energetically, everything changes about you. Everything. And so I walked into that school at, like, you know, I am going to make friends, and they're going to be amazing, and I don't care, you know, I literally. And mm-hmm. the first person I became friends with was, like, this girl who, like, could become friends with, like, anyone. <laughs> I uh-huh, mean, she, uh-huh. she was just, like, this, like, ah, nah, nah, like, very talkative. And so I became friends with her, and then she became friends with a million other people. And so we, like, started this little, you know, group. Uh, of like 25 girls and became literally the most popular girls in high school. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I went from being bullied and some of my bullies actually went to my high school as well. And mm-hmm. I think they were all like, what the heck happened to her? Like, how did this, ha- how is she now more popular than we are? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. They were in shock for the whole four years. I remember, I mean, they were like, really trying to be my friend. And, of course, I was very bitter and angry in high school, so that's a completely different story, but it was because of all the, the years <laughs> of being bullied. But right. um, but those four years really helped me self-esteem wise. It really, really did. Once mm-hmm. I had made the decision and I realized that, you know, I could control that, it, it was sub- on a subconscious level, of course, but, mm-hmm. but I could control, you know, um, my self-esteem went really high. I had really great friends. Besides them being popular, that wasn't even the important thing, is that they were really just really good people, really, really nice. Uh, they weren't boys. Mm-hmm. They were just really nice girls, especially the girls the, out of the 25, the, the ones that I would hang out with the most. They were just really nice people that made me feel good. And so those friendships uh, and, and my school, my school was an amazing school, really uh, built my self-esteem and my self-worth. And so um, I had high self-esteem, thank God, after after high school. And so when I would pick partners, um, I would choose wisely because I knew what I wanted and mm. I wasn't going to allow anything less. I was going to choose yes. uh, a good partner. I wanted to choose somebody that... Um, that was good for me. 
that matched my my self esteem, my self worth. Right, so, right. So yeah. So what I get yeah. from that is really um, work on your self esteem, your self love, and get real clear on what it is uh, that you're looking for in a partner that will bring that it's balance. Mhm. It is. I mean, that's like the most important thing right there. This whole mm-hmm. interview. It's it's what you just said. Um, mm-hmm. It all boils down to that. It all comes mm-hmm. down to that. And your mm-hmm. self-esteem and your self-worth. When you know your worth, when you love yourself, um, that's when you say, I'm not going to do any drugs because I love my body. I'm not going to allow this crap to go into my body. When you love yourself, you're not going to go to eat at fast food chains every single day because you're going to be like, no, I'm going to eat healthy because I love my body and I'm going to put healthy food in my body. When you love yourself, you're not going to allow people to talk to you a certain way because you're going to be like, um, no, don't don't treat me like I'm less than. I'm not going to allow that. Mm. When you love, I mean, I can go on and on and on. And I feel like it's a spectrum. It's not black and white. It's not I hate myself and then, you know, I, I absolutely adore myself. There's a spectrum. And mm-hmm. I, I encourage everybody to figure out where are you in the spectrum. From literally one end, I hate myself, to the other end, I call it, I give myself butterflies, the title of my book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I so give awesome. myself butterflies, yes. Um, where mm-hmm. are you on the scale? Are you somewhere in the middle? Are you more towards giving yourself butterflies? Or are you more towards hating yourself? And, and I, I think it goes up and down in life, depending on situations that, 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 that occur. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's something that's very important for you to look at and um, and figure out. And, um, you know, I've gone up and down, again, depending on situations in my life. Um, and now, I, you know, people ask me all the time, like, how do you love yourself more? How do you get, how do you increase your self-worth and self-confidence? And Dee Martini talks a lot about... Um, and I know this to be true from my own life, is you have to, have to, have to make it a priority to do things that you love every single day. Fill Mm -hmm. your day with activities that inspire you. Because if you do not make it a point for you to fill your day with things that inspire you, it's like your day takes over and will be filled with things that don't inspire you. If you're not scheduling your day and making sure you're doing things that you love, it's like life takes over. And often mm-hmm. you're doing things that you don't want to do. You're not inspired to do. Mm-hmm. We all are creators. We all have choices. Obviously, you're not a tree. You, you can move. You can actually move. If you're unhappy somewhere, move. If you if make it happen, um, don't act like you can't make it happen. You can absolutely make it happen. Um, if, you, yeah. if you can't stand your job, well, get out of that job. <laughs> Why you feel mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you are Absolutely. in a miserable relationship, get out. <laughs> like you know, right. and I and I totally get it. It's, it's not as easy as one, two, three. But make it happen. Make it happen. You are the creator of your destiny. And so, if you are every my days are, I love my days every single day. I'm very mm-hmm. clear on my highest values. Very clear on what my highest values are, and they're family uh, and career. A, and under the career umbrella is a bunch of other fun stuff like because I've made my career into all the things that I love so like mm-hmm. spirituality Italy you know food events and coaching et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. but um, so I make sure that every single day I'm only doing things that I like I will not do I will not say yes to anything that I don't like and that increases my self-worth and my self-esteem and my self-love because I'm doing I'm saying no to what I don't want and I'm saying constantly yes to what I do want and I get to, yeah. I get to um, create that, and it feels good. And and so that's what I would recommend to people is to to definitely uh, make that a priority. Find out what your highest values are. Find out find out what it is that you want to do. What do you do want to do with your life? And when you are constant, and this I guarantee it, <clears throat> once you are constantly on that vibration of creating and inspiring and doing things that you love to do and you're passionate and you you are just, you're coming, you're energetically, you are like gold, right? You Mm -hmm. are going to attract somebody that's on that same level that matches you because it's, it's like a magnet. You're attracted Mm -hmm. to people, other people like that. They're attracted to you. And so that's how you're going to attract a great mate when you are 
on that, you know, high vibration, you're going to attract somebody to be like, wow, I, that person is just, you know, wow, I don't know what it is, but, you know, lower vibrations are not going to be attracted to you. Mm-hmm. They're just not. And so get yeah. out of that funk, get out of that low vibration state and get into the high vibration. Find out what you love to do and do it. Life is way too short. I don't understand why people are like making themselves miserable. They, they don't have to. And so right. I'm, I'm very passionate about this stuff, about telling people, yeah. you know, do what you love because it literally affects every single aspect of your life, from your health to your relationships, social, mentally, everything. It affects your entire life. And so do what you love every day. If you love to meditate, I love to read. So that's one of my mm-hmm. highest, highest values. So I make sure to read every single day, something inspiring. I'm not reading like, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey or anything like that. I'm reading like <laughs> things that are going to get. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> oh, let me get to how I feel about that book. I'm reading things <laughs> that are going to get me inspired and to do, inspired, to have an yeah. even more magnificent life. So I read every single thing and I, and I do affirmations. And I create in my business. And I love to cook healthy meals for my family. So I cook every single day. And I, ha- I sit down and then I have dinners with my, my husband and my two kids. I mean, they, there are things that you cannot mm-hmm. take away from me because those are sacred. They're right. sacred. And, and if somebody asks me to do something that I don't want to do, I say, no, I don't want to do that. But thank you very much. So, right, right. Yes. Yeah. So... So for these women who are going to go through that transformation um, through that um, process of shifting their vibration, because that's part of what my program does. Um, awesome. Let's, cool. let's say You're that the right they have, yeah. <laughs> so let's say that they are there, their vibration is high, they're feeling good, they've met the guy. And for you, um, how, how how do you make your marriage work? So these women who may be on that spectrum because um, they're ready, they they want to find a, a life partner. Mm-hmm. And um, from your experience, you know, it, it, if you can put it in a nutshell, mm-hmm. how do you make your how do you make your marriage work? Well, first of all, I don't want to paint. Down. I don't want to paint a picture perfect. Um, no. Marriage. Because yeah. I don't think there's such a thing. I, I, I honestly think there's no such thing. And yeah. with that and with that said, it's perfect. And I'm gonna explain mm-hmm. what that means. <laughs> awesome. Um, first of all I want to recommend two books if I may. These yes, books please. are extraordinary and I really do think that every single person should read them. One of them is The Five Love Languages by Gary mm-hmm. Chapman. And yep. the five have you heard of it? Oh, absolutely. I recommend yeah, that yeah. to my clients. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's and, the app. App. <laughs> and the app. Yeah, the app. <laughs> and so you already know, and you can tell your clients more about it, but basically it's, we all speak in different love languages, which is quality time, acts of service, physical touch, words of affirmation, and gifts. And um, if you're speaking one love language and your partner is speaking a different love language, um, there's going to be a lot of heartache because, you know, you guys aren't going to understand each other. So... Um, for example, if your husband is acts of service and your words of affirmation and your husband is working overtime and he wants to be recognized and so you are words of affirmation, so you're saying, um, thank you so much, I love you, you're doing a great job, you're providing to the family, it's amazing. Well, he's acts of service, so what you just said means nothing to him. And so mm-hmm. for somebody that's words of affirmation, they're like, well, I don't get it, I'm, I'm praising you. And he's saying, well, you, you're never thankful, you never show me that you're you're you have any gratitude for everything that I'm doing? And you're like, what? I just, I told you. And he'll say something like, that means nothing to me. And you get all upset, like her, you don't understand. Well, what he wants is acts of service is something like he clean the whole house, keep it clean, maintain it, organize. Maybe if there's some clutter, clean that and organize. And for him, that's showing your love. So I highly recommend this book. I'm not going to go too into it, but I really recommend you figure out what your love language is so you can understand your partner's love language, and then you guys can speak in each other's language. The other book mm-hmm. that I highly recommend is The Heart of Love by Dr. Martini. Again, mm-hmm. Dr. Martini, The Dr. Martini. 
He's amazing. Uh-huh. And um, he really talks about um, his big thing is values, that we all have different values. And we are constantly, constantly acting on our highest values, no matter what, consistently. Whatever our highest values are, we're acting on them at all times. So if you figure out what your partner's biggest values are, then you can communicate your needs through their values. Because we all want to be loved for who we are. We don't want to be changed. And like I said, during the infatuation stage, you know, we make up this fantasy of who people are. And then and we, we expect, after the infatuation stage is over, we expect people to act uh, on behalf of our highest values. And we get upset if they're not, not acting on behalf of our highest values. And they're not going to. They're just going to act on their highest values. But if you're able to communicate your needs through their values, and I'll give you an example so this can make sense. Dr. Martini brings up a really interesting um, example of him and his wife, his late wife, I believe um, she passed away. Um, oh, no. oh, yeah, well, he had two wives. So I believe this is the one that passed oh. away. I hope I'm not horribly wrong. But um, <laughs> mm-hmm. she loved fancy dinners. She loved, you know, dinners that cost $1,000, $2,000, and the delicious wine and amazing food and talking and talking and talking and talking. Sounds like me. <laughs> I love <laughs> dinners. But I love talking. But... So, um, and he was not into that. Sounds like my husband. <laughs> so, um, so he's more into his highest values are his work, his work. He loves to write, research, and talk. He loves to inspire others. That's his thing. So um, what she started doing was she would say, I want you to come to this dinner. And he was like, no, no, I'm not interested. He's like, she was like, no, 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 at this dinner, there's going to be the head of a, a huge company, a CEO of like this massive company. I think he's looking for a speaker. So maybe you guys can talk and maybe he can hire you. And so then he had her attention. He was, then she had his attention. I mean, he was like, oh, okay, well, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> because she was communicating her needs. I, I want to go to dinner and I'm going to go to dinner with you. She was also meeting his needs. I know that this is going to be pointless and a waste of time for him unless he is, you know, making some type of deal because he's really into his business and he wants to inspire others. So it's a win-win. And most people will think that's manipulation, but it's not. It's caring. You're caring for both parts. You're caring for yourself and you're caring for the other person. You're meeting their needs. But what often people do is like, well, you don't love me because you won't go to dinner with me. And they mm-hmm. go into that territory, which is a very dangerous mm-hmm. territory. And the mm-hmm. other person's like, you know, you don't want to sacrifice in your relationship because then it builds resentment. So mm-hmm. you don't want to constantly be doing something for your partner just to make them happy. How can you guys both get your needs fulfilled and met? Like my husband's mm-hmm. really into sports. We're really into sports. If you want to torture me, take me to a sports game or show me sports on the television, okay? Yeah. If you really want to, if you hate me, show me. That's how you can torture me, okay? Uh-huh. He loves bars and he loves having a beer. If, mm-hmm. Again, if you really hate me, take me to a bar and show me a sports <laughs> game. And, I, I mean, I can't think of a worse time. I really honestly mm-hmm. can't. Mm-hmm. And so um, the way we've been able to handle it, you know, different ways you can, you know, I can take a friend and we can, um, I can be with my best friend and chat with her and have dinner while, you know, him and his friends are watching the game or, um, or all together, you know, sometimes he just goes out with his girlfriend. He has a lot of girlfriends. And yes, I said, girlfriends are friends that are girls. People will often mm-hmm. go, what? Girlfriends? Mm-hmm. Uh, he has a lot of mm-hmm. girlfriends and he'll go with them and um, I'll stay home with the kids because that's, you know, my priority is being with them as much as possible. And mm-hmm. um, and it works. He gets to watch his sports. He gets to have his beer. He gets to have his time. And um, and I get to you know, do what I love, which is be with my family. And mm-hmm. um, and that's how that works. You just make sure you're constantly, you know what your, your partner's top top values are you know what your top values are and you don't try to change them you don't mm-hmm. try to say you, my values are better than your values because that's ridiculous it's not true no matter what your values are 
I don't care if you're super spiritual. I don't care if you're super into your family and somebody else is into business and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, well, mine is better than yours. That's not true. Because in, mm-hmm. in a relationship, a good relationship is balanced. So say the husband's really into his business and into making money. And the wife, I hate to sound too stereotypical, but this is, this is the, the, the scenario that we usually see. Maybe because of society mm-hmm. for whatever reason, but this is the, the scenario we usually see. And yeah. the wife is more into having a beautiful house and um, raising a family. Well, so, so oftentimes they will get into this, well, my values are better than yours. But in reality, that's a perfect marriage because, you know, would the wife be able to have this gorgeous home and dedicate herself to her family if it wasn't for this husband who's making money and committed to the business? No. And would the husband be as successful if you didn't have a stable home environment, somebody who's taking care of, you know, the house, taking care of the kids and all that jazz? No. So it's in perfect balance. And that's why when we see that, when we see that we're constantly in perfect balance and we complement each other, instead of trying to get the other person to be more like you, um, we can have a magical relationship as opposed mm-hmm. to constantly nagging and you need to be more like this. No, you need to not be more like this. <laughs> more right. who you are. Exactly. We do that a lot. Yeah, and that's mm-hmm. so great that you help to clarify that a balanced relationship is really just um, the complementary pieces that you give to one another versus trying to control the the way the relationship is supposed to look like in that yeah. fantasy or in that image or what we see on social media or in reality shows, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, it's getting, it's getting real into what really makes a marriage or a relationship work. Yeah. Um, and like I was saying, you know, about mm-hmm. the um, perfect, it's, it's mm-hmm. perfectly imperfect. Um Yeah to kind of go on uh, what you were just saying right now um, is that we, the reason why we're in a partnership, anybody is in a partnership is so that they can help you heal those parts that need healing. Mm -hmm. So our partners are our greatest teachers Mm -hmm. and that's why they push our buttons so much. Mm -hmm. They push our buttons Mm -hmm. because they're triggering old wounds that we need Mm -hmm. to look at. And so, um, if we see that, if we see them as sacred teachers, um, then we can view everything from a completely different perspective. So, you know, my husband really pisses me off, which is very easy to do. Because, again, we're in a perfectly imperfect relationship. Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I have two choices. <laughs> <laughs> then mm-hmm. I have two choices, get angry and bitter and he's a horrible human being or say, why is this making me so upset? Because if it wasn't, right. if it wasn't something that needs to come to the surface, it wouldn't be upsetting you. Mm-hmm. So why is this upsetting me? And how can I heal this? And how can I, how can I make this, how can I become better? Hearing, hearing this information. Okay. Now he's saying this about me. Okay. Well, is that true? And why, why am I getting so triggered? I get very triggered, especially since I was bullied as a kid. There are a lot of triggers. And whenever him and I get into it, a lot of times I realize that it's just me being that scared little girl that's being, that, that got bullied. And, um, and so I need to, to, to realize that, to honor that. And I realize that I need to work on myself even more. Not that I'm, I feel, I, I don't feel like people are, not perfect as they are. But what I mean is, you know, to, to see those wounds and to heal those wounds and, you know, it's almost like um, saying, good little fuzzy monster, you're okay. <laughs> uh-huh. There are little monsters in the closet. It's okay. Right. You know, you don't have to be scared. You're not even getting bullied anymore. And, right. um, and luckily my husband's a wonderful teacher. And uh, we've been studying all this stuff together for so many years, so we can both kind of process a lot of stuff. And um, yeah, but that's that's if we see that, if we understand, it's not about a fairy tale. It's not about the happily ever after. That's not what a marriage is supposed to be. And I think that that's what most people think it's supposed to look like. So once it doesn't look like that, 
they get very upset and very disappointed. Um, like for whatever reason, my family in Italy, they don't, they don't study this stuff, but they, they really get this. And that's why I feel like they're genuinely happy over there because they really mm-hmm. do understand that that's what marriage is. It's ups and downs. They take the vows very seriously for, you know, you know, to, to learn the rich, you know, sick and sickness and health and all that stuff, like through the good and the bad, um, you know, that's what a marriage is, is, is going to look like it's going to it's going to bring up a lot of stuff but that's the mm-hmm. point of it to bring out all that stuff so you can heal it and i'm not talking right. about abuse abuse is right. never acceptable that's never acceptable i'm talking about things that trigger you and the arguments that people have on a day-to-day basis or the things that you know um just you know take you off Mm-hmm. Uh, looking at that and see, like, okay, later in the life, it's upsetting. And how can I heal this? How can I work on myself a little bit more so that this, I can heal this part and not be so triggered by this? Where, did, where is this coming from? This asking, where is this coming from? So, mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. All such beautiful, beautiful wisdom. This was so great, Connie, and I'm so appreciative of you sharing your experience, your life, your love, your wisdom. And I know that this is going to give these women the courage to find that clarity and raising their vibration so that they can attract a man who treats them right and they deserve it. So yeah, that's, I, that's the most important thing is to, if they really, because a lot of people say they want um, a relationship, but they really don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're, they're they really don't. They're scared of whatever they're scared of. And but if they really truly and, and to look at that and to see what is this about. Um, one important thing, and then you know we can um, we can close. One important thing is to see when people say, "I want a soulmate." I mean, what do you want in a soulmate? Well, I want somebody to talk to, and I want somebody that's affectionate and loving. This isn't, you know, I want somebody to take walks with, or whatever it is. Who, Dr. DiMartini talks about that nothing is ever missing in your life. If you look hard enough, it's there. So who in mm-hmm. your life right now is fulfilling all of that for you? Who is the person that's giving you love and affection right now? Who is the person that you're, you can talk to right now? Who is the person that you're taking walks with right now? So you're, it's almost like your soulmate is dispersed into various people, several people. So it's like several people make up the soulmate. And until you look at that and you see that, you always think that something's missing. But if you realize that nothing's ever missing from your life, you know, they're all there, just maybe dispersed in different people. Maybe your, your mom, your sister, your uh, best friend, whatever it is, um, you don't feel that sense of lack or something's wrong with you. But if you do want it from one, all that from one partner, which a lot of people do, then like as we were saying, it's all about you focusing, instead of focusing on, I want a man, I want a man, I want a man. Mm-hmm, <laughs> instead mm-hmm. of focusing on that, focus on you. What do you love? What would you love to do? What would you love to create with your life? It's never too late. Start now. Do everything that you've ever wanted to do. Do you want to travel? Do you want to take a hot bowl of bath? Do you want to go yoga, to, 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 to some yoga or exercise or be by the beach? What is it that you want to do? And fill your day with inspiring activities. And like all the stuff that brings you down, all the people that bring you down, all the negative smellies, get rid of all mm-hmm. that. And just do things that inspire you. And your vibration will for sure change and you will attract an amazing mate Mm -hmm. absolutely well thank you again Connie this has been a great experience and I am so excited to share this with the women and I thank you so much thank you sweetheart thank you so much you're doing amazing work so wow you're you're very lucky (laughs) thank you thanks